G'day guys, Ronnie Vale, Four Wheeling Australia. Welcome to Modified Episode 100. 100, the 100th episode. This vehicle's been part of the channel since almost day one, so I think the 79 deserves to be in Modified 100. Stay tuned guys. Here we are, modified episode 100, and here's the rig. What is it set up for now? Well, it's set up for remote touring towing, with trailers, of course. It's set up for weekenders, and it's set up for the tough stuff, so playing around. We've got play tires, we've done a few other things, which you'll see with the suspension. We've got a full GVM upgrade, we've got a full set of conversion. We've got a lot of stuff that we've done to this vehicle, so therefore, there are skip points down below, which I'll remind you guys about, because this is a lengthy video, but of course, if you watch it from start to end, which I highly suggest, because it's some pretty epic stuff going on right behind me here, you'll get to see the whole feature. This is what we're covering. And as you can see, there's a fair bit to talk about. Now, just one more thing. This episode of Modified is of course sponsored by the Terrain Tamer East Source. If you're looking at rebuilding a vehicle like I have here, or like all the other people who've been on Modi Modified previously, they're worth checking out because they're the leaders in four drive replacement parts. Alrighty, let's get into episode 100. We'll start with the front of the car, the bull bar of course. This is an Onca bar. I've been asked this many times already. Where do I get this bar from? Well, the Bush Company in Australia supply these. So that's where you can get it from. Now, the reason why I went for this bar is because no one else has really got it yet. Yet. So maybe I shouldn't have told you where I got it from. It's a unique looking bar. I love the look of it. There was another one I was thinking about going for, but I wanted the hoops just to still have the practicality of protecting my lights and all that. It doesn't have indicator lights in here, and that's because it's got this hoop that allows the indicator light to be seen, like it exposes it, therefore it makes that road legal. On the front here, we have a hitch receiver, so you can push a trailer around. I think they're actually designed for people to push boats into the water in, in South Africa. We've got two recovery points here. Uh, there is a winch inside this. We've got these air vents here, which will help with the cooling. Also, to help with the cooling, I've removed the winch box that I used to have in my old bull bar that was sitting here. So I had two lights and a winch control box up here, which was kind of blocking a lot of wind going in. So I now have this open, and that grill is a black doubt grill from eBay. 
And that's my original badge, by the way. I just sanded it back and painted it. A bash plate and a diff pumpkin protector. They've been on there for around about nine years, eight and a half years. They've served me quite well. There's quite a few scuff marks on it. They're a bit rusted up, so I might actually get them line or something later on. And around the side, these are brand new rock sliders. These are by On Track Fabrication, the guys who made the previous one that I had on here as well. The reason why I changed them was just to change the look on, on the vehicle really. They're mounted exactly the same as the previous version. So I have no doubt that these are probably going to be as strong if not stronger because we're going with square tubing on the inside. I'll put a lot of things to use right there and then. The suspension, the tyres and that side step. That side step did not move one inch. Ooh. I have line X the top of this plate and we went for two different hole sizes that are least used for rock sliders, just to make it look a bit different as well. People are gonna ask me why I haven't upgraded the mirrors. I don't like the big Dumbo towing mirrors. I don't need towing mirrors. I don't tow caravans, but I tow camper trailers and I can still see down the side. These do get frustrating sometimes when they're, they're in a rattle and they wobble, but I just really don't like the look of those big Dumbo ears that people put on their cars. Each to their own. On here I've wrapped the flares. And speaking of wrap, we've wrapped the entire bonnet black with some red details on it. And I reckon it looks bloody amazing. I did consider going for the brand new Toyota Land Cruiser bonnet, but I actually prefer to look on this one. It's time to talk about the last piece of the exterior protection on the vehicle, and that's the Rhino hide. And why am I standing on a dune? If you're familiar with the channel, and you probably are, this is the Rhino hide protection panels for scratches and, you know, little rocks and sticks and whatnot. So they'll absorb the impact and they'll prevent the scratching. And as you can see, it's doing a good job right now. First five years or six years of owning this vehicle, it got scratched and dented to, to all kinds of levels underneath these panels. This does hide it all and it does prevent me from getting extra ones, but it's really scratched pretty bad underneath already. You may think it's drilled into the vehicle. It's not, it's actually 3M tape high temperature, low temperature, really good sticky stuff. 19 kilo pull force on each one of these. And you get a torque key, which you just screw them all on. And there you go. Welcome to the rooftop bar. I'm on the first level. That's where the drinks are. And this is the second tier. Let's go to the second tier. As you can see, I have changed my roof rack. And that is because of load ratings, which I'm not really gonna get into with the previous one. This one here is a front runner. And in regards to load rating for a 79 series, a dual cab, the roof load rating is 100 kilos. And once you put the roof rack on, which weighs about 25 kilos, I've got 75 kilos left of roof load that I can add to it. I haven't exceeded that. I've kept it you know, fairly minimal as much as I can. So we've got two sets of max tracks on either side. Now the reason why I have two on either side is because you know, we can jump up one side, get these off, jump up the other side and get those off. Because usually in a recovery, your mates generally help you out. We've got the red ones up here to match the whole red and black theme. So I'm loving these, these set it off. Now, I only just got these recently, before I had the orange ones and this just sets off the car. I really love it. Underneath these beautiful red and black extreme tracks, they just suit the car so well. We have the brand new Max Tracks mounts. Now these are made out of the same material, so they're quite light, which I like about them. And you can't stuff up the spacing because it's governed by the mounts. In the middle, we've got a solar panel, more than enough. And that tops up the back battery, which is in here. We'll get to that later in the electrical. Come winter, it's probably gonna give me maybe 70 watts out of it, if I'm lucky. But it's still enough to run that fridge. Underneath this roof rack, I have a front runner table, which is a really cool addition because I don't have to store a table down here. I don't have to move stuff to get the stuff. Just up here, 
open the latch and basically pull it out and there's my table. It can be the first thing out and the last thing in. And it's also the reason why I've angled these tyres. Because if these tyres were standing straight up, I wouldn't be able to get this in and out of the roof rack. So that's another reason. It's probably the fourth reason why these tyres are on an angle. On this side, we've got a shower tent, and I've always had a shower tent on this vehicle. It is the best thing out when you're traveling with your missus or with your kids, because you can just pull up anywhere. They don't have to go into the bush or whatever. Change room, shower, every, all your needs right there. And then people don't have to look at me naked. So a lot of people will be thankful for that. <laughs> on this side, we've got the 180 awning. This is the same awning I used to have on the Hilux. Loving it. That's why it's on this vehicle. Now the reason why I love it so much is because it's compact. It doesn't stick out the front or the back. So it doesn't, it's not an eyesore on the vehicle because to me looks do matter a little bit on the car. Probably a lot more than a little bit. Now it doesn't give you a bucket load of coverage, but it gives you enough. And if you park the vehicle on the correct angle on the beach, it's, it suffice. I do have a wall kit for it as well. The antennas, well, there is one still attached to the roof rack and my second antenna, which is a GME 2.1 dBi. Now, we've done a test on a 2.1 dBi versus 6.6, .6, and honestly, you get as much range out of this that we found out. Uh, that's what we found out anyway, when we did a test. It's on a flip down bracket, so I can go through a drive through. Just underneath the roof rack, it's sitting on three gutter mounts. Now, normally you only get two with it, but I've opted to put six mounts on it in total three on each side and that's more more or less just for peace of mind this gutter mount is a bit worn as you can see here from previous racks it's had on In darkness we find camp. Get on the merch store. We're going to talk about lights of course because it's about to get dark. So not much has changed on the front of this vehicle as you probably would have noticed already. So let's walk a bit closer to the front. Now I've got to keep the engine running because there is a lot of power being drawn right here. So on the front I have upgraded the headlights to LEDs. Um, that's actually from Life Force. On the front HTX2s I've had these for a year and a half. Before that, I had the HTX1s for about three years before that, actually. And up there, we got two light bars, 20-inch light bars. This is the best lighting setup I've had so far on any vehicle. And now, combined with the ones on the roof, it fills the gap in between. So there's only so far these LEDs go. The light bar then picks up where these stop shining to. And then I've got a good 800 meters maybe of like LED light and then the HIDs, they take up what's up ahead. Really stoked with that and that's why I've stuck with it. Now around this side, and both sides actually of the bull bar, we have fitted some Rock 20s on the side. They're switched on the inside as well, so they're like the side lights. So as I'm driving down a track, I get a bit of side light. I can see where I'm going if there's any logs or trees right in the corner. So probably my most important light are these ones when driving forward and turning. No light up here. Um, I will add a light to the awning later, but that's not really a driving light. Over here we've got the work light. So I can, I can sort of twist that, put it up, put it down. If I've got the awning out, I can actually shine it up into it. Um, then that way I'm not blinding all the campers, everyone who's camping. So around the back now. Oh, listen to that V8, I love it. So at the top, and these ones down here, that's my reversing lights, but also I can put them on at camp. It puts out a ton of light, so say if we're, well, not if I'm fishing. Well, I'll be fishing, my mates will be catching. That's the kind of lights we shine to the back of the beach. Pretty similar to the setup I had before as well, but I've added these now. This makes a ton of difference when I'm reversing on tracks, but also I've got a camera up there and a camera here when I put all these lights on and I'm driving forward, I can see everything behind me like it's daylight as I'm driving. Coming back around this side now. We've pretty much got a carbon copy of the lights. Here's the other work light. But I'll show you something that's really cool. These lights are on. The side lights are on. I kill the car, all the lights go out. But wait, there's more. If I 
put on the work lights, which are now on. There's my work lights. All right, so I've set up my swag and I've climbed into my swag and I go, oh crap, I left the lights on. Ah, all good. Lock the car and they go off. Now, if I need to go for a tinkle in the middle of the night, get out of my swag, press the lock button again, courtesy lights, 30 seconds. Also on the front and here. So that way you can go for a bit of a piddle, you're not gonna step into anything or whatever. Uh, also, if you hear something scratching around your camp, you can then put the lights on and stick your head out and see if there's anything going on. And that's all switched through to PDM. Another addition of added rock lights to the vehicle. Eight in total, which I did here at Custom Installations. That's where I got them from as well. It took me a day to install, but I reckon it was well worth it. The main reason for these lights is pretty much more of a looks thing than anything. But when you have rock lights and you hit, like say, the power line track in Perth or those gnarly tracks, they actually help spotters locate, you know, where rocks and things are and what's going on underneath your vehicle. So they do serve a purpose, but I'll be honest, it's more of a looks thing. Now I'm just gonna make sure the kids don't know which button it is on the interior. Otherwise, I might get myself into a bit of trouble. To celebrate the release of the big horse, we've got some exclusive patches just released right now, today, on the store for Wheeling Australia merch. And of course, the brand new t-shirt. There's a fishing shirt as well. Check out the store guys, get on it before they go. Let's get back to it. Suspension time guys. I've opted for the three inch the Superior Outback Tourer kit, not the coils kit. And I'll explain why I didn't go for coils in a little bit. But before that, we're gonna cover the whole suspension kit. And there are a lot of components. A much worthy mention here are the boys at SWAT in Perth, Western Australia, when well, up actually, they helped me out with the whole lift kit, installing it all, and they pulled the old kit out. And as you'll see, the old kit was looking pretty damn sorry for itself. That's not to say it didn't serve me well. So the kit I initially had in here was a Dobinson kit, and it lasted for a good three years, I'd say. And it definitely copped a good punishment. As you can see, everything just really flogged out and rusted. So it was time to change the whole suspension. So that compared to the new stuff, yeah, it is a bit of contrast there. It's a full complete kit. This gives me GVM of four ton, which is engineered and certified to four ton. And to get that, we got a whole new axle housing, chrome alley axles. We got the works through the whole thing, starting with the front suspension. Up here, we have the remote res mounted on a bracket above the, the call tower. This is paired up with a shock absorber that's also adjustable. So there are two adjustments, uh, rebound and compression. Now I haven't mucked around with them because they're set in the middle and it feels pretty right to me. Now the rears I may adjust next time I go towing just to see if it makes any difference. Adjustments for the suspension, well there's one on the remote res, it's pretty easy to get to. The other one is on the bottom of the shock itself down here. But they're pretty easy to get to, on the front at least. On the rear is a little bit of a different story. The reason why I really like remote res shocks is because the travel that I do in WA is quite remote. There's a lot of corrugations, a ton of corrugations everywhere you go. And it's getting worse and worse with more people getting full drives and heading out there. So that will prolong the life of my shocks just for the pure fact of cooling it down. And you won't overheat your shock and then you won't get shock fade and all that stuff. With this superior kit, there is also heavy duty coils in the front here. Paired with the shock absorber and the front radius arms, the flex on the front is actually present now. It actually flexes on the front. Now the 79 struggles mainly with flex on the front end of the vehicle itself. The rear end has never really been a problem. Radius arms, let's talk about them a bit more. I am so stoked to have proper radius arms now. So for years I've been dealing with adjusted bushes on the front. And the problem with, I had with that was once you start really doing some heavy stuff off-road, they will sometimes spin, the eye of it will spin. And then it kind of puts off the location of your front diff a little bit. 
So having the arms in a fixed position with fixed bushes makes so much difference. There's less clunking around, there's less adjustments, there's less visits to the suspension place to get everything adjusted again. But I also reckon the bushes will last longer because they are like the same all around. They're not like spinning and getting squished a bit more. It's still lifting wheels, but nowhere near as much as what it used to. The 79 would usually pop the front a bit more. And even like in this situation, the back would normally be off the ground. It's cool. These are never gonna be a flex machine, but it's definitely way better than it was before. First time ever I've had the correct spacer on the sway bar. Previous lift kits I've had, I've had to change the sway bar uh, spacer so many times because it was too short, it was too long, it wasn't quite right. And this doesn't contact anywhere, it is just good. If you get a whole kit that's designed by the same company, and I think that's where it really makes a difference to get all your geometry of all your suspension working. So the front hand I'm stoked with. The rear suspension, I can see it a bit better here. On the back we have the leaf pack and yes I will address that in a sec why I didn't go for coils. So three inch on the rear as well as the front. We have a bump stop extension here. 10 leaf packs, so leaf springs on the back. We have the new high clearance plates underneath as well. And the Achilles heel 4 to 79 when you're going up rutted country and, and rocky stuff like this stuff is the actual leaf pack itself. High clearance plates, it does provide a bit more clearance, um, but it's still the Achilles heel on a 79 with a leaf pack. With the GVM upgrade, it's mainly to do with the rear, is the upgrade of the axle. Now that we'll still get to in the drive line but that is accompanying the whole four ton full GVM upgrade. The adjustable shock absorbers in here as well, they're at the base of the shocks, but for the remote res, they're kind of tucked in up there. So it is a little bit of a mission to get to. It's probably the only downfall um, of the suspension, I would say. It's tucked right up in there, but they are protected. So nothing's gonna hit them. And having two fuel tanks and all that, it's probably the only place you're gonna be able to put them anyway. Time to talk driveline. And as you can see at the moment, we've got the play tires on. So we're out of here in the dunes, seeing what these trepidors go like in the sand. They flick a lot of sand, but those actually do pretty well. Anyway, we'll talk about that more when we get to the tires. But for now, let's talk about the driveline. So the driveline, I've upgraded and done a lot of maintenance on it through the boys at Midland Auto Plus. This was on the hoist for a number of days. The front super hubs were completely restored. We got two new CVs in because they were clicking, they were getting a bit on. So I've gone through three CVs in nine years. That's not too bad, I guess. And one side was that bad, I actually had to get the grinder out just to get the CV out of it. All new kit from Terrain Tamer and all the other components have been stripped, cleaned and painted. Now, there will be people saying, what are you doing, Ronnie? Why are you putting drilled and slotted rotors on your Toyota? Okay, here's the thing, I've had them before and they lasted longer than the factory Toyota ones. Now, a lot of people will say that they're not good for off-road because the sand gets stuck in it and, and it really gets abrasive and, and makes them wear quicker. I didn't find that. And you guys know how much this 79, what it goes through. So I think that's a good testament to it. So that's, therefore, I've gone back to them again. With the braided brake lines, that's part of the Superior kit with the um, brake booster upgrade as well. So now, when you hit the brakes in this vehicle, and the first time I did that, I nearly headbutted the steering wheel. I did not expect the brakes to be that good. On this car, it's actually better than the Hilux, the brakes on this car right now. The handbrake, we've also done a lot of maintenance on. It's working now, but these handbrakes, absolute crap. It will eventually go again. At the moment, it's holding, but we know we're gonna be putting rocks under these wheels at some point anyway. Right now, it's in gear. Then, of course, there's the rear diff. And that rear differential housing and the axles combined with the whole lift kit gives me that four ton GVM, which is absolutely great because it's more than what I need.
It's a long way there when you're sitting on a rock. Tires and wheels, guys. What has changed? A fair bit, actually. Before we get into this combo, I now run a touring set. Da da. And I also run a play set. Which is really cool. I can't wait to show you that one. But for now, let's get into what's on right now. People are going to say I'm pro steel. And I am pro steel. If you only have one spare, definitely got to have steel wheels. I have aluminium now. So as you'll note in, in the back, I have two spares now. And I'm always going to carry two spares so long as I have alloy wheels or aluminium wheels. These are P-Core wheels. Negative 25 offset. Um, they are... 17 inch which means that i now have a little bit less sidewall but having almost 35 inch in size there's heaps of sidewall as there is so as we have here we have 315 70 on a 17 inch wheel these are the max's razors my favorite tire so far and this is my fourth set uh, we even had a set on the hilux as well that is the current touring combo six of these here's another thing behind this cap you have to take this off to unlock your hubs, but the only time I would ever unlock my hubs is if I'm going for a very long drive across the Nullarbor on the way to Sydney or something, then I'll take the time to pull these off. It's not that much of a pain really, but you do have to take these off if you want to unlock your hubs. If you're one of those people who don't like it driving around with your hubs locked constantly, although your car's fine if you do it. That is the touring setup. Also, this combo, complies with my four ton legal with this tire wheel combo and you'll note that these are not 35 inch they're 34 point something we've already touched on the touring tires that's the play set super aggressive sidewall just climbs in and out of anything so much fun so these are the Maxxis Trepidors. They are actually proper 35 inch in size, which equates to a 325 slash 75 on a 16 inch rim. Now these rims are also Pico rims. On 20 PSI with these tires, they just mold and shape and grip on anything you can throw at them. They are freaking awesome. Great play tires. We're on the power line track, kind of one of those places where you can really get the full potential out of your play tires. The bead locks have arrived. So this is an internal bead lock. Kevlar sleeve in a tube with a valve. So this means that I will have to drill another hole into the rim. So I'm gonna have two valves. This will sit inside, secure the tire and prevent that from falling off. Also, it becomes a second tire essentially. So if I completely shred a tire, I can actually still limp my way out just on the Kevlar sleeve. Are they any good? Absolutely no idea. I've never tried these before. I'm gonna try these in the play tires. If they do very well, I may consider these into my normal touring set. Six of these cost me 1,500 bucks, but definitely not touring tires. I will try these at the sand dunes just to see what they go like. But I would not be touring with these tyres. That's what the razors are for. Very noisy on the road though. Don't recommend them on the road. On those particular trips where I may need these tyres, I've got the two spares. The thing is, they're directional tyres, so I've got to have one of each. Because if I blow one on that side, I've got to have the same tread direction. It takes me about an hour to change all four tyres, and well, all six tyres, I should say. It takes me about an hour. I've got it down pretty quick. Recovery gear, let's talk about that. Before I show you the winch rope and what this thing's about, this is a brand new worn winch. It's a 12,000 pound. I opted for that because the other one I had, which was a 9,500 pound, it, it did well for the vehicle. Well, I had that for over eight years and done many recoveries with it uh, on myself and other vehicles but I found that it was always a little bit underpowered, so a lot of the time I had to do double-line pulls. 
Now we've got a 12,000 pound winch in here and hopefully I'll be doing less double line pulls. And you probably want to know what this dog bone's all about. So what I've done is I've gone down the line of the Max Trax soft um, recovery kit. So there are no metal objects at all. There's no metal hook. There's nothing metal. You pull it out, magnetic, so you can stick it there. And then you can attach a soft shackle to the end of this, which means it eliminates any metal out of your recovery, which is bloody great. So should something fail, it probably won't kill anyone. With winch extension, we've now got the rope. This is a 10 meter winch extension rope. Now, compared up to a big strap, it takes up bugger all room. And it's basically like another winch rope. So should I snap the other winch rope, I can replace it with this. It's only 10 meters though, so there's an option there. On the back here, you noticed I had another winch controller in here. Well, that's actually for this winch down here. Now that's a TJM winch. I've had this since the tray was put on. I've only used it five times. And the most recent time was pulling Chris's Prado up over a bank, got a bit stuck. But you know, did I really need to use that winch? No, because Chris has got his own winch and I could have also snatched him out. It was there, so I found an excuse to use it. That's pretty much all this winch is, is an excuse to use it. Right at camp in daytime, for once. What I'm gonna do is before we run through the tray, I'm gonna show you what it looks like with all the stuff in it. So I've gone back to just a flat tray with two spares, a fridge. You can see I've packed for two people, so we've got two swags. Underneath this swag, there's a chair and a couple other things. There's a double chair up here. There's a bucket for showers. And there's a box with tools and jacks and things like that. And then here there's a box with food and stuff. Behind the spare tires, I'll get to that once we unload all this stuff. This will only work for trips that are up to maybe two weeks long at a pinch. But anything longer, generally 10 days or longer, I'll hook up the trailer. Let's empty this out. Tray is empty. This is a PCOR tray. I've had this since 2019, early 2019, so I don't know, two, three years. I had the tray for. It's been the lightest thing I've had on the back of the ute so far. I'm happy with it, so that's why it's staying on. I have Linex the bottom though, as you can see. So nice and black in here. It was getting a bit scuffed up and I drilled a lot of holes in it, so this kind of hides all that as well. Being two to three years old, there in between. This piece here absolutely copped the beating from all the stones from the front wheels. So that I took off and got Linex. The wheel arch itself, I got that Linex as well. And it just comes up looking brand new. Obviously now it's pretty damn dirty. Two spare tires. The tires are on an angle. There is a good reason for that. So this is what's behind the spare wheels. That is the original mount that comes with a PCOR. So on-track fabrication have made up this bar system going across, also jigged it so it's on an angle, and we've got a stopper down here, and the other stopper's up here, and it's just much more stable because the, the tire's actually touching um, one, two, three, four, four contact points. So it doesn't really move around. Also, contact point in the middle too. It looks amazing. Most important one though, I can fit all this stuff behind it. There's all my ground sheets. Recovery gear's in here as well. So it's just drop the tray side, grab the gear out. There is loads and loads of room. If I had not angled these tires, this 150 mil would have been unaccessible without taking the wheel off. The rear drawer, 
It's a bloody good draw, I've got to say. I've just had to be a bit smart about organising it. And you can see it's pretty deep, it holds a fair bit. It's sealed very well over the past two to three years. So just got a bit of fire cooking equipment. Um, this is actually really cool. This is all my um, kitchen gear in this one bag. Like that, so I've got plates and um, breadboard, knives, a bit of, bit of everything in here, chopping and all the spices and plates in here as well. So that all lives in here permanently. Even if I bring my trailer, this still lives in here permanently because if I drop the trailer off at camp and we head out for a day trip, at least I can still chop things up and make lunch. Yeah, just all my general stuff, so sunscreen, all the stuff for the tow hitch, tire repair kits, shovel, axe, toilet paper, and tools as well. This Pico tray comes with a 70 litre water tank. It's poly, so it's not stainless steel, but it tastes okay. Bit of cordial fixes that taste, and that taste soon goes. But in here I store my wet gear. I've got the shower, 12 volt shower in here, face washers, spare hose, and that's about it. Oh, there's one thing you need to know. There was, used to be a big caravan sort of pump in here. Because the seal is so good, it traps the moisture in there because there was a slight leak and that got into the motor and killed that. And then I bought another one, killed that one as well. So now I've found this little pump which pumps out a lot less water, which means the water doesn't just um, like just flush out of it. It's, it's a, a lot slower stream, which means that you're not wasting too much water. I used to have the compressor mounted under my front seat, but because I changed my seats, it wouldn't fit. So it's now in here. You know the best part about this? This is hooked up to my lithium battery, so I do not need the vehicle running to pump my tires up. That's pretty cool. It's a twin ARB compressor, as you can see, and this is my Indeflate, which gets used all the time for deflating and inflating. A bit more of the recovery gear up here. It's got like the uh, winch controllers and stuff, and in here is all my spray cans and, and stuff like that. As you can see, this time round I've opted for a 60 litre Elements fridge. This is an ARB 60 litre. This is designed to be outdoors. As you can see, it's silver to reflect sunlight. And the best part about this is the strut. It holds the lid open so you can go in and grab a drink out or not, or grab some food or whatever. And you can open it the whole way and pull stuff out of it too, if you want to clean your baskets and stuff. It's always good to try something new and I am stoked to have gone to a 60 litre. Now, if you've followed the channel, you would have known that I've had a 60 litre ARB fridge, a classic one, on this cruiser for most of its time, actually. That fridge, when underwater, was in the elements the whole time, and it held up pretty good. I've still got that, that's actually in the trailer now. So that used to live outdoors in this cruiser for probably a good four years of the cruiser. And as you're probably aware, if you're a frequent follower of the channel, you know that the gear gets tested to its full, full limits when I've got it anyway. And I've added a little touch to it right here. Oh, we're getting a bit close here. The fridge, I run it at zero degrees in summer. And I suspect that when winter comes, I'll probably run this at two degrees. Celsius. Let's take a closer look at the interior. We have overhead console, completely redesigned. Uh, it's a design collaboration by Custom Installations, and Chris has done a fantastic 
job on this whole thing. Impeccable, I think the word is. So we got roof console, front console, rear console, and a full seat conversion using Schulman seats. These have heating, but I have not hooked up the heating. I live in Western Australia, I do not need heated seating, but these can be heated. They have seven adjustments in these seats. And we got the extra large Schumann seats in the front, and we just got the large um, Schumann seats in the back. And it's a four seat conversion with an engineered and certified rear seat bracket. So this is a legit four seater conversion, which gives me even more in GVM because I only have to account for four passengers and four lots of cargo now. This whole lever interior, which has the same lever um, and fabric as the seats. So this is Schumann leather and fabric all the way from Germany to match the chairs. And that is why this console and this whole interior, just, it just looks so damn mint. It is so awesome. The only thing though is the dash. I haven't done the dash and I know people are going to pick on that. But you know what? There's plenty of black trim on it and I'll probably will eventually paint the dash black as well. Let's look at the more important stuff. So the front console, we got six buttons on the front here, which toggle floor lights on the front, floor lights on the back, rock lights on the outside. Uh, there's a couple of spare. Uh, there's one that powers the USBs, which are up here. That's all the buttons in the front. Uh, we have the PDM over here, which has all my uh, lighting. So this controls all my spotlights, my roof lights, my work lights, reverse lights. Uh, also activates the winch controller uh, and does a couple other things as well. So that's all the smart wiring. Also does the cooling fans on the uh, new Cross Country intercooler as well. Uh, moving on, with the console, Chris has actually done this one to take up the, the gear levers as well. So these are brand new boots on top of the gear levers, on top of the gear sticks. Over here, we've got a ram mount, which I'll put in. I'll put another ram mount up here as well that holds the GPS. I was getting frustrated with the suction cup mount on the window, so it kept falling off. So that has sorted that out. We've got two cup holders. we got two like little phone holders here, I guess, but I'll use this one. The new GME XRS, this is the 390C. So this has GPS inbuilt inside the handset. So if you've got a mate who has one as well, like Torbs has one, we can actually see each other's GPS coordinates from the handset. Pretty cool. I now need to learn more about this. This is the latest one I put in the vehicle. So that sits there, right, right there, nice and handy. Now we have another radio in the roof console, and let's just jump to the roof console now. So up here we've got these little speakers so I can hear what comes out of radio. Got another magnetic mount over here. And that's just like an old school GME. I've forgotten what the number is on it. Uh, but that is my uh, road radio. So this will go on channel 40. This will be on my convoy channel. And up here we've got these little map lights, which are quite handy. We also have these lights. So if I want to go red, red retains your night vision. Um, we can, we got one of these stalks on either side. So my passenger can read maps or whatever, or you know, needs to find something on the floor, which also helps having these little floor lights. So you can see what's on the floor if you drop something. Uh, and then the roof console goes back to, we've got a factory light in the back, which seems to work. We did look at LED options, but we preferred that. And then up here, we've got this little bungee cord spot here. We can store heaps of other little things. I've gone away from that drop down thing I had in the previous one. Everything in the interior has been blacked out as well. So, so the A pillars, the B pillars and the C pillars are all blacked out. The visors are blacked out. The whole ceiling is blacked out. Black felt, so I can still get my patches up there. In darkness we find camp. It's dark right now. And the door cards. The whole of the door cards are done. got a new steering wheel as well. So I've gone away from the old school 79 series bare bones steering wheel. PVS one that's been converted by PVS. So it's either from a 200 series or a Camry, I'm not sure. Uh, but it's got all the buttons on it as well, which are paired into my Kenwood stereo. This stereo is flipping epic. And I've got Helix speakers in. I uh, don't know much about stereos, but this stereo pumps. I've got two subbies in the back. We'll look at those in a sec. And just buttons everywhere to do lights everywhere. There's actually 16 USBs in this vehicle. 
16 USBs. I oh, know, way too many. Let's jump to the back. The back seats and the rear console. Oh my goodness. He has done such a fantastic job on this thing. Okay, so if you are a passenger in my vehicle in the back seats, you're going to have a good old time because you're sitting like you're sitting at the movies. Yes, there isn't a lot of room in the back of a 70, regardless if you do the seat conversion or if you have the bench seat. We've measured, we've actually measured this up at um, On Track Fabrication, where we did this whole seat bracket. So Luke did that one. When we first put the seats in, we were like, oh my God, there's actually not much room in here. But comparing it to the normal bench seat, it's the same amount of room, except for these seats actually go further back. It's like a cinema. It's so, so reclined compared to the bucket seat before. So this four seat conversion, you end up with a massive armrest, which uh, this houses my subbies, by the way, this center console here, the rear console. And we've got some lights here that are over the kid's shoulders so that I can read a book or do some drawing or whatever when we're on the highway. Obviously off-road, it's gonna be a bit difficult and you can actually change it to, to white as well. The red will be good if they need the light while I'm driving because the white light in the back is gonna distract the driver, of course. These other two buttons activate the USBs, which are down here. And then in between the two USBs, there's another button that powers the red arc inverter, which is behind the seat. Phone holder here for passengers. We got some woofers in here. One this side, one this side. The USB ports up here. The reason why I mounted this radio so far back is because when we're in convoys, sometimes we give the kids a different channel to talk on so they can sit here and have a good old yarn to each other as well. Massive window for the kids, good seats, nice reclined, nice and comfy. The kids are gonna love this, they haven't even seen it yet. Let's talk power system. I don't have a canopy, so where are my electrics? Behind the seat, of course. I used to have two subwoofers and all that behind here. They're now been moved to the center rear console and we'll get to that later if we haven't already. This is my slimline battery. It's 110 amps. It's not a cheap battery. It did cost me some coin. Uh, the boys at Klarman Automotive Solutions helped me put it in. They actually did all the electrics on, on the back. Uh, and then after that, I did all the electrics or well, wired all this up inside the interior afterwards. But most of the hard work was done on the back wall here and that made it easy for me. And I'll show you why it made it easy for me. It's to do with whatever's on the other side there. We'll get to that in a sec. But this is where the battery is. Pretty damn slim line. Does it give me enough power? On the roof, we have 120 watts of solar power. And that is enough power to power the fridge and to power my system. I park the car outside, it sits in the driveway, solar, it's always there. If I park in shade when I'm camping and I'm staying there for a couple of days, then I'll get the solar blanket out, but only if I'm gonna stay there for a couple of days. So unless I'm towing, I probably won't bring the solar blanket with me because there's one less thing I've got to bring. The other side. Okay. So right there, which you can't see, but it'll be on the screen now, is a solar input and a vehicle input. So the power comes from the front, goes into the back here, then goes into the BCDC, this is the 1240D. Uh, that means it's 12 volt, it does 40 amps of charging. It actually does about 43 amps when you're driving. Also the D means it takes solar. Over here we have what's called the Egon system. Now this is a popular thing at uh, Climate Automotive Solutions Workshop. It's just a power central hub. And when I say it's just a power central hub, it's actually a bloody good hub because half the wiring you see in there, actually more than half the wiring you see in there, I did myself. It is so easy. All I have to do is bring the wires from where they need to power from that appliance to the back here. Nice and neat through these tracks that are all around it. There's one, two, three, under the carpet, through there, and in there they go. And then we got all these fuses. If one of those should blow, a little red light will illuminate and then it sort of makes it easier to fault find. 
The only thing you can get wrong with this is putting the wrong size fuse in. That's probably one thing. I will go back to Climate Automotive Solutions and just get high enough to check all my fuses just to make sure that I haven't put a fuse that's too big for the wire because we want the fuse to be the fuse, not the wire to be the fuse. Red eye converter down here. 350 watts and in here we have a Victron shunt. The Victron shunt allows me to see how much power goes in and how much power goes out. I can see the state of charge. So that is my power solution because I don't have a canopy. There's nowhere else to put the power uh, and that's how I've done it and it works. What's new in the engine bay? There are a couple of things that stick out. Those are the shiny things. Let me just put it out there already. I understand that the motor looks really rusted out. It's not actually rust, it is Pilbara dirt, it is Kimberley dirt, it is dirt from all over the country, New South Wales, Queensland, you name it, that's where the dirt's from. Um, that said, this engine is absolutely bulletproof, has been just spot on for me 250,000 k's on the donk which i know isn't that much really since 2013 but i try not to daily drive it that much i generally try and use the hilux or the mrs car i think i have to address all the old stuff first before we go through the new stuff so it does have a uni chip which has a five map tune so tune five is your stock tune tune one is your get up and go tune two is pretty much your low range driving and then there's like uh, two other tunes that don't really matter what, the, what they do they're just two different tunes that i play around with when i'm off road um very difficult to explain because you kind of need like different environments like really rocky stuff i'll choose a different tune and then just general low range i'll choose uh, choose tune two bit of a tongue twister there the general stuff has been done secondary fuel filter here which has been really good it's, it's actually caught some water before uh, it's also caught a lot of aluminium shavings before as well and some previous tanks that I had. There was just a little bit of swarf that it caught. We got the diff breather kit here. This is actually by PDP. Um, they do some pretty solid stuff when it comes to diff breathers and fuel filters. They also did the tune for me. And there is a PDM which is out here, which is the electrical system. I'll get to that inside the vehicle when we do that because it's very complicated just to, and I don't want to explain it here with all the engine bay. We have two batteries. That's all I'm going to tell you about that here because we're going to talk electrical at some other stage. Stock turbo with the tune. So we haven't over-tuned it. So I always ask for a moderate tune. So it's definitely got get up and go. There is a water cool alternator in here, which is still my favorite mod for a 79. First mod, if I bought one, would be the water cool alternator. 100% sealed alternator and it gets its cooling from the actual radiator uh, cir circulatory system. So that goes through, cools the alternator. And that way no dirt and water can get in there and mix up and then just fry them at the alternator. I have fried some alternators in the past. Now to the new stuff. Up here, we have a cross country intercooler and they were kind enough to do a black and red to suit the theme. And I reckon it looks absolutely fantastic. I've had a stock intercooler since day one, but now I've gone to this. Has it made a difference? Yes, it has. It does have two cooling fans underneath, so it's consistently 50 degrees cooler overall, which is great. Uh, on a beach run where it is soft sand, it's more than 50 degrees cooler, which is great. And that's pretty much what I want it for. Everything I've done since all the other stuff has all been about cooling. Speaking of cooling, we got a terrain tamer radiator right here. And that actually came from the terrain tamer e-store, <laughs> sponsors of the show. No, they were, they were happy to help me out with a radiator here. So the old radiator, which was a genuine Toyota, which I've never had an issue with, genuine Toyota alt, um, radiator has been really good, but it was pretty clogged and needed cleaning. So I figured let's chuck one of these in and try that out. This has consistently run the vehicle two degrees cooler. I know it's not much. That said, it's been very much consistent though. So it's keeping it around 86 to 87, whereas before it would creep up to 89, maybe 90, uh, fluctuate a little bit more. This kind of stabilizes that a bit more. 
which has been great. Now I'm going to do a full video on just engine temps and engine cooling. So I'll get, in, get into it more there because this is modified. It's a big video, man. Let's move on. Soon we're going to take this thing out and do some trips. In fact, as soon as you watch this, I've headed off the next day on my first solo trip. Hanging for it. Q&A has been moved till next week because this video is super long, super detailed. And I thought I'd give you some time to get your questions to get in the comments below. So always give questions after the fact. So this is going to work out perfectly. I'm going to head up bush, so I'm heading right now to pack up the vehicle and then I can answer your questions. To the best of my ability, I'll answer as many as I can. Alrighty guys, thanks for watching and please do subscribe because it helps the channel immensely. Alrighty, toodaloo, au revoir.